So I want to thank you all, alhamdulillah, for having me here today. It really is an honor to come here to address all of you on topics that are so important, topics that we leave behind, the ones that we you know, don't necessarily talk about, right? And they're ones that need to be talked about. We need to discuss these things. So inshallah, I hope to, you know, as I'm addressing you, think of any questions that you may have, anything that comes to your mind, so that we can, you know, discuss it afterwards. We'll have some time for a question and answer, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qur, Ayah 16, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْبِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ This is my favorite ayah in the Quran. It is my absolute favorite ayah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really brings us closer to him with this ayah. What does he say? And we have already created man. And we know what his soul whispers to him. And we are closer to him than his jugular vein. So three things in this ayah that are so important, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws us to him, okay? Number one, he created us. He created us, so he knows us more than anybody knows us. And he knows us more than we know ourselves, because he's the one who made us, he's the one who created us. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what his soul whispers to him. Anybody in psychology who reads this will just be, wow. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the inner voice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about what we have within our own minds. And this is really the beginning of depression or the beginning of any kinds of belief that we have about ourselves is that inner voice. What does your voice, and we all have one, we have inner voice, sometimes multiple voices. It doesn't mean we're crazy, it's natural, okay? You're not crazy, it's natural to have those uh, voices inside of your head. But it's important to get to know your inner voice. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on also on how important it is to know yourself. Because that inner voice can be demeaning. It can be damaging. Okay, so if that inner voice is so negative and it puts you down, it makes you question yourself, then it's going to affect the way that you feel. It's going to affect the way that you are with yourself and others. Allah points it out in the Quran that we know what your inner voice says to you. So this is comfort from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if our inner voice is negative, okay, and one way that you can tell or you can get to know your inner voice is when you look in the mirror. And I tell everyone this, look in the mirror and talk to yourself. It's healthy, it's good. Okay, so you look in the mirror and you talk to yourself. What are those things that you say to yourself? What comes to your mind? And this is your inner voice. So Allah says, you know what? That voice that nobody else knows what that voice is, I know what that inner voice is saying to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us how close he is to us. And he knows that inner voice. So it gives us a bit of comfort as well. You know, that that inner voice is mean and says, you know, you're not doing things right, you're gonna fail your exam, you're never gonna get anywhere in life. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. He knows how harsh we're being to ourselves. And that can give us that bit of comfort. And the third thing is, Allah says we are closer to him than his jugular vein. More closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the vein that our lives depend on, Allah says I'm closer to you than that. So this vein that if it's cut, that's it, we're gone. Allah says I'm closer to you than that. This is a closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this Ayah really is that cure for depression or that cure for feeling down or feeling that kind of sadness. Is Allah saying, you know what? You're not alone. I'm with you and I created you and I love you and I will never abandon you. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is key. Having that close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most important thing. And I'll go back into that. Uh, you know, near the end, but it really is the essence. If we're missing that relationship with Allah, then there's no way we're, we're gonna be happy. There's no way that we're going to really be successful or get to where we need to be. But of course, there are other things as well, you know, that are important. When we're going through tough times, when we're feeling down, it's important for us to think of other things as well. 
what is what is the stigma that against, that exists against depression? Any thoughts or ideas on that? What do people say about depression? What's the reason why we don't talk about it openly? Any ideas? Yes. Okay, so people say just deal with it, it's not that big a deal, you're not dying, it's not a physical ailment, just get over it, right? What else? And maybe it can be portrayed as a, as a weakness of some sort. A weakness, yeah, definitely. And this is why a lot of times people don't want to admit, right? They don't want to admit that they're going through the depression or they have some kind of symptoms of depression because it's seen as a weakness. Someone else have their hand up? Mm -hmm. uh, some people think they need to control it. Okay. Um, you just get out of it whenever you want. Okay, right? Just, you can control it. You have control over it. Get out of it. Think positive. Just read the Quran, right? We have all of these things that people say, and they're not really understanding, right? That it's not that simple. So, is it religious weakness? People say it's religious weakness, right? Or a weakness in general, or attention-seeking behavior, right? Oh, she's just trying to get attention. And people ask, what do you have to be depressed about? You know, focus on all the good things you have in your life. Just turn to Allah. What we need to do as a community, as an ummah really, is to fight these stigmas. We need to be understanding. We need to <coughs> empathize with others. We need to be more accepting of others and ourselves. A lot of times we're the most judgmental of ourselves. That if I'm sad, I need to just get over it. Or I need to do something to distract myself. But it's okay. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to you know, suffer through depression. It's all right. And we need to have these conversations more often so we bring that about, that feeling of, you know what, it's all right. It doesn't mean I'm weak. It doesn't mean something's wrong with me. It doesn't mean I'm not a good Muslim. So these kinds of things really need to be discussed. And, and we know that we all go through tough times, right? And that's, that's the human aspect of us, is that as humans, we can relate to each other. That we go through tough times. Every single one of us will go through difficult and there's a reason why. Allah says in Surah Mulk, Blessed be he in whose hand is a dominion, and he's able to do all things. Who has created death and life, that he may test you which of you is the best indeed, and he is the Almighty, the awful giving. So what is the purpose of this life? The purpose of this life is a test. We're going to be tested to see which of us is the best. It's really a race for the finish line. The finish line is what? pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? People say Jannah, but it's really that pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with that comes Jannah, right? So it's a test. And something I learned um, from my sister, she see, she teaches, when she teaches others, she teaches others that tests are not really tests, but they're opportunities. Because sometimes when you say that life is a test, it automatically kind of brings you down. You know, you know it's a test, I have to go through a difficult time. But tests or difficult times are actually opportunities. They're opportunities to become closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They're opportunities to, um, you know, have a chance to do good, to have a chance to have our sins washed away. So we we can look at tests as opportunities. So what is depression? What is depression? That's why we're here, right? Any thoughts? What is depression? feel sad most of the day, almost every day. Any other definitions? Mm -hmm. The blues? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes. Like everything that happens around you always feels like it's another big thing that went down. You can't seem to think of why you're leaving. You feel that and you're like, oh, why did this happen? Yeah. That so no matter good. what happens, right, it's, it's something bad. negative. Good. So my favorite, uh, my favorite definition of, is about depression is depression is anger turned inward toward the self. Anger turned inward toward the self. So somebody who's dealing with depression is really an angry person. But the anger, instead of showing that anger, it comes out in sadness, right? In negativity and worthlessness, feelings of worthlessness and hopelessness, right? Towards the self. So the symptoms vary, right? There can be so many different types of symptoms. Uh, you can feel sad, even anxious. Somebody who's depressed can be anxious, empty, feeling empty, hopeless, guilty, helpless, irritable, restless. So there's so many different kinds of um, symptoms.
symptoms of depression. There's one account of depression from a college student I want to read to you. And let's see if you get like a better view of what depression is. And again, depression is something different for each person, right? It can be very different. So just listen to this. My undergrad was in English, so I, I really love these like poetry and writings. So she says, it feels like your body gets heavier the longer you try to stay motivated to do things. Feeling empty, constantly alone, having to make yourself try to be happy. I'm a junior in college. I work as a server in a very high demanding, high volume restaurant and constantly worry over money and bills. I feel like a failure. I sleep constantly, so much that I miss class and I hate myself for it when I do. I feel like I'm useless and lazy because of it. But my body is always tired, my mind too. Doing assignments for class is barely tolerable and only accomplished by reminding myself of how badly I'll feel when I fail at the end of the semester. I'm paying for school, yet I can't seem to be motivated by it anymore. I have very few friends, none of which are close. I've never been close with family. Even the relationship I currently have rarely makes me happy anymore. But I think it's all because of how I feel, all because of my depression. I just want to. really is that cry for help, right? Somebody who feels so down constantly and everything, like you said, everything surrounding them is negative. Relationships, jobs, school, just everything becomes negative and they become, you know, kind of drowning, really, kind of drowning in that type of, of sorrow. So we went into a little bit of a picture of what depression is. But there are actually different views on depression, okay? And two I want to go through today. Because the more uh, widespread accepted view is the medical opinion, okay? Which is what? Depression is a disease, right? Depression is an illness, it's a medical illness. So this is what the psychiatrists uh, and people in the medical profession, anyone in the medical profession here are going into that? No? Okay, a few of you here? Okay, I was gonna say we, might, we, we may butt heads with this, but so the medical professional, medical professionals and psychiatrists, they see depression as an illness, right? Something you can't get away from, something that just happens to you, something that's just made genetic or temporal imbalance of the brain, okay? Anybody heard of that definition? Okay. So what they do is that they follow the uh, DSM, right? The Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and they go through that, they follow that um, list, right, of symptoms. Uh, so major depression is defined as a severely depressed mood that goes on for two weeks or more, interfering with a person's daily functionings. And it also includes loss of interest, of pleasure, weight loss or weight gain, insomnia, hypersomnia, fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness, guilt, diminished ability to think or concentrate, recurrent thoughts of death and suicide. Okay, so that's what they go by. Marriage and family therapists, um, we don't see it that way. We don't see it that way, that it is a, you know, a medical illness, okay? We actually see it as a social phenomenon, okay? So something that is more of a social problem than it is, um, you know, an, an illness or a disease. So what we do is that we view and treat depression from a multi-dimensional, systemic perspective. So we won't only take the individual, but we'll really look at all the factors in his or her life that are kind of contributing to that situation. It could be family issues, uh, relationship problems, uh, life stressors, whatever it is that's kind of leading to and exacerbating those kinds of symptoms. So although one person is manifesting symptoms, we believe that the problem is the, the relationship. Okay? So again, we, since we see it more of a social problem than an illness, it actually empowers the person. Of course, I'm biased as I'm saying that, but it really does. It really gives the person uh, that belief that, you know what, I do have control over this in a way that there are things that I can do to make things better. And, you know, I had one case with, with a woman who came in and she really, you know, was given that diagnosis, you know, and she came in and she was saying, I really, you know, this is something I'm gonna have for the rest of my life something I can't get away from. I just have to be on medication for the rest of my life. And this view really does bring a person down. It really does 
uh, make a person feel even more help, help, helpless, right? That they're not even able to do anything about it. But I said, what if I told you that it isn't an illness and we can actually do things, I can do things to help you and you're gonna get better. And you should have seen her face. Like it really changed from completely hopeless to I have hope now. I have hope now. And subhanAllah, it really made a difference in her life. It made a difference in treatment where now she had the motivation, right? Even more of a motivation that, you know what? I can help this to go away and it will go away. And alhamdulillah, she's doing so much better today. So it really is uh, empowering. And another thing that that does is, is it really normalizes it. It doesn't say, okay, you're a sick person. You have a disease, you have an illness, and then you take medication. But it normalizes it. That you know what? You're going through depression. You know, we all kind of go through that here and there. Right? We all kind of go through some of these uh, symptoms that occur. So it makes them feel normal <coughs> and human, just like we all are. Uh, clinical psychologist and an MFT, Dr. Michael Yapko, he actually wrote a book on this. Depression is contagious. How the common, most common mood, mood disorder is spreading around the world and how to stop it. And it's a really amazing book because he really talks about how when you, uh, you, you know, call something an illness, it's going to spread in that way. You know, people kind of use it as, you know what, I, I'm sick. You know, there's, there's nothing I can do about it, right? So it kind of, it can, it can spread in that way. It gives somebody kind of, sometimes a crutch to kind of a fall back on. So he says, by treating a social condition as though it's a disease, the problem will spread rather than diminish. And again, it can stigmatize them further, like I mentioned before. So what we do as marriage and family therapists, we pay attention to the psychological aspect of depression. And that's what I mentioned in the beginning, the inner voice, right? That we have those negative thought processes that deal with that. So what causes depression? Okay, now you know the different views. Right, so what, what causes depression? Any ideas on that? What leads to it? If you're a psychiatrist, you're gonna say chemical imbalance in the brain. But if you're not, what do you think causes depression? And you're, you're open and entitled to your opinion, right? We're all accepting of each other, yes? Um, a pre tragic event or a continuous series of great events happening all at once time. Yeah, definitely, a tragic event. A tragic event, something difficult that happens in your life. Any other thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. It also might be how you deal with that specific event. You were in the state of depression and you were gone. Right. And you realize that um, you're gone, right? You're just, um, you just lost your state of Definitely. Yeah. So it really does depend a lot on how you deal with that situation, right? Some people are able to, you know, they have resilience, they're able to kind of bounce back and deal with it, others it takes a bit longer. So I have a list here, right? Because like I said, it's not just one thing. Stressors, negative thinking, environmental, social issues, cultural and family issues, diet and exercise, uh, feeling alone or isolated. So again, that kind of goes back to like the negative thinking. Conflict in relationships and unrealistic expectations. So, you know, there are a lot of, and, and there's probably a longer list, right? But I just picked a, a few to kind of uh, give everyone an idea of what causes it. So do you think medication is sufficient to make all of this go away, all of this go away? And that's one thing, you know, one, one view, because there's uh, the, one of the main treatments of depression, right? You go to, people say you feel depressed, go to your doctor. And your doctor is gonna prescribe antidepressants, right? which is the most common prescribed drug these days, right? So you can think of you know, antidepressants, there's so much research on it, I won't go into it, but they basically can, may possibly ease symptoms, right? But there's so many different kinds of antidepressants that you have to sometimes try another one, try another one, one's having, <coughs> having a bad side effect to one, you have to try another one. So a lot of times it's difficult to even figure out you know, what way to go about. So the treatment for depression. If you're a family member or a friend of someone who's going through this depression, that can be difficult as well. It can be very difficult. Because at some point you feel, okay, this is 
person is just bringing me down, they're bringing negativity into my life, there's negative energy, I can't be around this person. And that's natural too. It's difficult to be around that type of person. But we also have to be, think of them, right? That what they're going through, they need acceptance, they need our support, and you know, they really need us to be there for them. So, so show up, you know, show up in their lives, uh, you know, check on them, message them, whatever it is, but be there for them without any judgment and with acceptance. You know, this is more of what we need, uh, you know, in the world. So I went into antidepressants so already, I jumped. Um, but basically what a lot of times the antidepressants does is it defines the person's role as passive. It defines their role as passive. Oh, I'm, I'm taking meds, right? So they leave everything else aside. The doctor gave me a prescription, it's gonna be a fast fix, and I don't have to do anything else about it, right? They think it's just a, a drug, it's gonna make it go away overnight, and there's nothing else I have to do. But that's where you know the mistakes occur, because what we do in therapy, right, and what therapy and counseling can provide is it really helps the person to, you know, it empowers them to be a part of the treatment process. It lets them work on themselves and to try to get somewhere. So antidepressants, therapy, right? What's the stigma that uh, exists against therapy? Throw it at me, throw it at a therapist. Any stigmas, any negative things that go around? about therapy? You're crazy if you go, okay? Anything else? It takes away from your manliness. Okay, it takes away from your manliness. It makes you weak, right? It makes you weak. Okay, yeah, anything else? Basically, if you're crazy or you're weak if you go. And it's something we don't want to share with others, right? And this is also something for us to change as a society, as an owner, right? Because therapy, what is it? It's not just for the person who is dealing with any kind of you know, negative symptom or diagnosis, right? It's for anybody dealing with, with anything. You know, I really believe it's, it's helpful for everyone. And I don't say that because I'm a therapist, but you know, I see the, uh, the process. You get to know yourself, right? You get to know your weaknesses. You get to know your strengths. You get to know, you know the ways that shaitan can come at you, right? There's so much that you learn about yourself. So what we do, what therapy is, is that you sit, you don't lay on a couch, okay? You sit with a mental health professional and you work together, right? You work together as a team. It's not somebody giving you advice, it's not somebody telling you what to do. You work together as a team to kind of figure out what's, what's going on with you, okay? And you can discuss ways to relieve symptoms or how to build on strengths and resources. It's a very empowering process. It's a very um, uplifting, motivational process. Um, and I really think everyone can benefit. And again, I'm not just saying that because I'm a therapist, but I go to therapy as well. So when I began my, uh, my program, right, our professors told us, okay, you all should go to therapy as well. Of course, we had that first initial thought of, why do we need, why do we need therapy, right? But she said, oh, you know, just go because you'll understand your own issues. Of course, everyone's saying we don't have any issues. And so, you know, you can also understand the other side of the chair. So I went, that was, or five years ago, and I've been going ever since. Because of, and I'm not ashamed to say it, because SubhanAllah, it's made me such a better person. Because I'm, I was able to learn so much about myself, I had no idea. I had no idea uh, these things about myself. And I was able to kind of work on myself, improve, become a better person, improve my relationships, alhamdulillah. And it's because really Islam encourages it. Islam encourages us to know ourselves and to work on ourselves. And that's what therapy is, that's what counseling is. You're sitting with a counselor, a professional, and you're saying, focus on me so I can better myself. Let's figure out how I can better myself. So what's the Islamic treatment for depression? Again, I mentioned in the beginning, and that is that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I want you to all imagine Right? And I want to tell you to close your eyes because people might start falling asleep. But just imagine you're in this dark well. Okay, It's a dark well. So we don't have wells these days. But you're in a dark place, okay, like a tunnel or something like that. And you're at the bottom, right? And you're kind of broken and you're laying down and it's dark and you can't see anything. Okay? 
And at the top of the well, there's a light. And that light is a hand that's reaching down. It's a hand that's reaching down to help you. And this is the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will you be able to reach that hand if you stay laying down on the ground? Stay, you stay laying down on the ground. Are you going to be able to reach that hand? No. What do you need to do? You need to reach up, right? You need to lift your hand and reach up to try to grab the hand. And this is the same thing with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is always there. The hand is always there. The light is always there. He never goes away. He never disappears. He is always there. And especially in our darkest of times. But it's up to us to reach up. It's up to us to reach towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help or for closeness or for guidance or for whatever it is that we're trying to get. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if you run, if you even walk towards me, if you even take <coughs> one step towards me, then I run towards you. Right? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaching out even farther. Even though we, you know, we're lazy, right? We'll just go, eh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches out even farther for us, right? So it's really for us to grab on to that uh, hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Ustaz Yaman Ali Khan, he said that the moral, ethical, spiritual, psychological decline of the Muslim Ummah is because of their lack of connection to the Quran. And this is really the bottom line. If we don't have a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Creator, then this is going to lead to our decline. Spiritually, we're going to be lost. Our hearts are going to be hurting. Something is going to you know, be broken. We're going to have some kind of disconnect. We're not even going to understand ourselves. Allah is our Creator. If we are not close to Him, then we cannot even, you know, be successful in ourselves, right? For ourselves, we won't even understand who we are. So the key, though, is to hold on to the Book of Allah, really, before depression sets in, before a difficult time sets in, because oftentimes when somebody's in depression or a difficult time, they're already in that state of hopelessness or difficulty or despair. And to be honest, it's tough to pick up the Quran during that time. And that's why when people uh, do say, okay, I have depression or I'm feeling depressed, tell them to pick up the Quran, sometimes, sometimes they really can't. Sometimes they don't want to, right? It's the, least, it's the last thing they want to do. So it's really for a friend or somebody who can support them to really hold their hand and to really help them through that. So grab onto the Book of Allah before anything like that happens, before a difficulty occurs. So you'll already have that attachment. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, another point is that Allah doesn't burden a soul more than it can bear, right? Has everyone heard of this, right? Says it over and over again in the Quran. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what somebody is going through, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala believes that you're strong enough to handle it. You're strong enough. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't put you in that situation if he thought otherwise. And so this is where we figure out our inner voice. What is our, what is my, if my inner voice is saying, I can't handle this, that's where we challenge it. And we say, if I'm going through it, the very fact that I'm going through this means that I can handle it. And I'm strong. I'm tough enough. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting me through this. And He would never put anybody through something they couldn't bear. So this should help us to believe in our strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Therefore, remember me, and I will remember you, and be grateful to me, and never be ungrateful to me. So we, and that goes back to what I was saying. When we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He remembers us. And remember in the sense of blessing our lives, helping us through difficulty, uh, you know, letting us you know, pick ourselves up from wherever we are. We know that the Prophet them also, as our example, he went through many uh, tough times, right? His year of, so uh, of difficulty was called the year of sorrow. It was called the year of sadness. So he went through this year of, you know, the loss of two of his loved ones, right? His uncle and his wife. And he went through this very difficult and tough time. So the prophets went through it. And righteous people go through it. 
So don't tell me depression is for the weak, right? Because the strong people go through it as well. And so it's an example for us on how to deal with it better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah 13, Ayah 28, that Allah bi-dhikrillahi tatma'inul qulub. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that for indeed in the remembrance of Allah, you hearts find rest. So the heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, it finds solace, it finds peace in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you feel, and sometimes we can feel this, that we don't feel peace or we feel agitated, it is because we are far from the Quran or from the relationship, the closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because any time that we turn away from Allah's remembrance, we're going to feel agitation, uh, sadness, worry, fear, whatever it is. It's a signal that we need to reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all love our phones, right? Yeah? We love our phones. The battery's going low. What do we do? What do we do? Seriously, we panic. Okay? We panic. I did that on the train just a few hours ago. <laughs> the outlet wasn't working. I'm like, oh my gosh. We're, we're sitting, the outlet isn't working, right? Alhamdulillah, my husband found one a little farther away. I could breathe again, you know? So, so our phones give us this indication of our battery going low. And there's no way that we're going to say, oh, no big deal, just die. I'll just, I'll just use it a couple of days later. I'll just look at it next month. I'll just pick it up during Ramadan. We can do that. It's so important to us. So, the same, even more so is that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That our connection should be at 100%. We're happy, right? We see that 100% battery. Our connection, or the Wi-Fi is like very strong, so our connection to so our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be at a hundred percent, no matter what. Right? The greatest signal. And when we get those indications, sadness, worry, fear, worthlessness, whatever it is that you know gives us that agitation of the heart, that's the battery going low, right? Or the Wi-Fi not working. We don't have the password, right? This is that indication that we need to strengthen, we need to plug in again. We need to strengthen that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. So here are six things that we can do that, right? That is plugging it back in, strengthening our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're nearing the end. Number one is the wakil, which is full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where a lot of us struggle. I struggle, right? Sometimes I just have to be in control, right? I have to feel like I'm in control of things. And this is human nature. But, and a lot of times, depression comes from this, right? The feeling of loss of control. I feel like I don't have control over anything. I feel lost. I feel like my, my life is just a tornado, right? So, it's about realizing that we're not in control. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And just leaving it up to Him. There's so much uh, relief, there's so much peace in that. When we leave everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is sabr or patience. And patience isn't something where you sit back and relax and just wait for something to happen. Sabr is an active state. It's not a passive state where you just sit down and just wait for some miracle to happen. Sabr is perseverance, okay? It's pushing through the pain. It's pushing through life's struggle. But you know what, I'm not gonna give up. No matter what I go through, I'm never gonna give up. I'm gonna keep plowing through. Right? So that's sabr, active state, not just sitting back and waiting. Number four, dhikr, right? Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everybody has their strengths of dhikr. Some people like fasting more. Some people like doing more nuwafil. Some people like actually doing more dhikr as they're walking around. Find your passion. Find what you like to do. There's, that's the beauty of Islam. Allah has given so many things that we can do that will give good deeds. You know, charity. It can be anything. So find your passion, what you're good at, what's easy for you, and what can give you those rewards. And, and be involved in that. Number five is ilm or knowledge, right? And alhamdulillah, you're here. And you probably have so many other uh, events that you can go to that you can gain knowledge. With knowledge, that really is that first step. 
if you don't know where you're headed, right? You're in a car and you have no idea. Again, your GPS on your phone is not working, right? No network found and nobody has those old GPSs anymore, right? So you have no idea where you're going. How are you gonna get there? You're not gonna be able to get to your destination. And this is why we have to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get to him. You have to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn his names, learn his attributes, learn everything about him and his relationship with you. That he loves you and he created you for a purpose and that's to worship him. So know Allah in order to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number six is that taqwa or that consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being aware of him at all times. And that comes with that remembrance, that comes with knowledge, it comes with good company. It's the most important thing, is to have that uh, good company around you to remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just ending off here, I want to really just have you remember to take time out in your life to focus on your heart. We spend so much time focusing on our mind. Right, we learn, we study, um, you know, we we grow in that sense, you know, that, and we think constantly, what do I need to do tomorrow? What, when is my paper due? When are exams coming up? We think a lot, but we don't feel. We don't feel, and we kind of push that aside, or we try not to feel. An example of that is if you're gonna push away your feelings is a beach ball that you're trying to keep underwater, right? You're trying to, we're all dreaming of summer now. So the beach ball that you're trying to push underwater, it's gonna keep popping up, right? There's no way that you're gonna keep it down. It's gonna keep popping up above water. The same thing is with your emotions, your feelings, what you have in your heart that you're trying to sh hide. You're trying to keep it under the rug. It's gonna keep coming back up in some way or another sadness, anxiety, loneliness, whatever it is, it's gonna keep coming up. So pay attention to your heart. Ask yourself, what am I feeling? Write in a journal. Right? It's manly to write in a journal, okay? It's manly to think of your feelings and to express your feelings, right? Because that means you're not afraid. You're not afraid of others. And not being afraid of others and being open to being vulnerable is strength. That's true strength, right? And that's what we need to redefine as a society, that what is true strength. So take time to focus on your heart. And if you are struggling with depression, you are struggling with these kinds of feelings, just know that in that darkness, there is a light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of all lights, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nuru samawati wal earth. He's the light of the heavens and the earth. But he has created you, and he has created a light within each of you. So in the darkness, take time to notice that heart, right? Take time to pay attention to your heart. Find the spark that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put within you. Ignite it with all the things that we talked about, and shine. Let yourself shine. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you for that purpose. To be empowered, to be motivated, to be loving, to love Him, to feel the true essence of what can lead you to paradise, right? The happiest place you could ever imagine. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to, you know, take what we've learned from here into our lives and to, you know, unite us in a place that's even greater than you could ever imagine, which is Jannah Gilgadis. Ameen. Thank you so much.